Okay, sorry, that one ran out of batteries there. So, okay, so we were saying, um, you know, for, you know, if you're just one screw, um, then, and, you know, you can only have one pitch. So say we're going to give it just a pitch of one. That's non-negotiable. That's going to stay, and all the blue lines have to satisfy that. Well, if you try some D, then that locks in the theta, and then you can do a circular hyperbola, and they'll all keep the same D and theta. So that's one circular hyperbola to satisfy. If the D gets smaller, we just talked about how theta, because of this, according to this relationship, would have to get larger to keep the pitch the same. And then that would be kind of a more shallow circular hyperbola until finally if D was zero, this is where we left off, um, right? Then, then the only way the pitch could be one or whatever you picked it to be would be if tangent theta is infinity. So zero times infinity could be one. So that means this has to be 90. Okay, so, so blue lines that, inter that are perpendicular to the green line, which is what we proved before, would work too. So you could imagine spinning that green or spinning that blue line around and it would get a disk. So, so notice this dashed line here is collinear with this green line on the constraint space. So a disk at its center would work and then, and then very shallow circular hyperboloids with you know, uh, fairly large thetas that are less than 90 but close to 90 or, or have small d's and then as d gets larger and larger and larger this theta approaches more and more to zero till like see this one the, the d is so large it, it's it's almost uh, uh, parallel to 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 uh, the green line okay but that would you know by the time it's parallel um, then then uh, right th then then if 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 this ever became parallel so theta was zero then tangent would be zero, but d would be infinity. It would be so far out, it would be infinity, so infinity times zero, it could, it could still be one. Okay, so by the time it's out there, it's like a, a black, or sorry, it's a, it's a blue hoop uh, out at infinity, but we haven't talked about blue hoops yet. Okay? Okay, so, okay. Um, okay, and, and, and first of all, this is also worth noting, so, so hopefully you can visualize the shape. You can see I just, I, I drew the critical disk, and then I drew, showed you how these, they're, they're not exactly nested because they, kind of, they kind of overlap with each other as they go out, as you can kind of see I drew, I just drew some examples. But the other thing that's interesting is that's just from one point. You could take this whole space and move it up and down the screw. You could center the disk down here and have everything centered here and move the whole circular hyperboloid up and down and it would all work. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a confusing thing to explain, but, but it, it's not like this is locked to some certain point on this. I mean, it is, if we're going to draw the circular hyperboloid like this, where the neck of the circular hyperboloid is right there, and the disk is here, then yes, that point corresponds to that. But there's no special reason it needs to be there on the screw. Remember, the screw is, is infinitely large, so I could move this point up and down and everything with it. So it's like many copies of this up and down. And, uh, and if you can visualize that, then you essentially visualize the entire equation P equals D tan theta uh, as uh, uh, you know, in addition to the entire freedom and constraint space here of a single degree of freedom, okay? Okay, so let's use this, cons you know, this, this knowledge to, to design something. So say we wanted to design this guy, you know, here's a parallel system, there's the two rigid bodies, and we want to connect them so that it achieves a single screw with a pitch P, okay? And let's just allow that to be anything except, of course, zero and infinity, okay? Well, then what we do is we look at that constraint space, and you got to ask yourself, how many things would you have to select in that constraint space to be exactly constrained? Well, you'd have to select, you know, 6 minus 1 is 5, so you have to select 5, okay? But we also want to be symmetric here, so maybe we're going to over-constrain stuff. So, what, first of all, there's, there's a bunch of disks in there. Oh, by the way, by the way, going back to this, you can see, well, how does this lie in the constraint space? First of all, notice it's that twist. Um, it's the screw rotated like this, and so you imagine that shape stuck on that screw going back like this. But these two lie on a disk, these two lie on a disk, and this one lies on a circular hyperboloid, okay? So those two come from a disk, and those two come from a disk of the whole shape moved down 
that comes in circular hyperbola. So you can see how this topology lies within that constraint space. Okay. Um, okay. So so. Oh, but again, going back to this, um, say we want to design a new thing. Say we don't want to. We don't want to pick. We, we already found out we we need to pick five constraints to be exactly constrained, and we know this big complicated shape, and we can move it anywhere up and down along this screw's axis. And, and let's say we don't want to use the disks like we did in the past example. Say we want to use the circular hyperboloids. You know, so what I'm saying is we don't want to use this. We want to use some circular hyperboloid. Well, remember, how many things can you pick within a circular hyperboloid uh, before it starts being redundant? Well, the answer is three. Okay, So you'd pick three from the circular hyperboloid um, uh, from one of them. Okay, But in this case, we're going to pick four just because it, it, you know, so we're already going to over constrain it by one, um, you know, with one redundant constraint in there because we're picking four from the cylinder, but we're doing that for symmetry's sake because it looks like, you know, there's these Chinese star things and we want them all to be 90 degrees away from each other and so it's like a kind of a square kind of thing. So we're going to pick four, okay? Notice we're going to pick them all so they have the same D and the same theta, okay? So it's D1 and theta1, and so all three of these, or sorry, sorry, all four of those blue lines, obviously because they have the same D and the same theta, D1, theta1, they, they all lie in the same circular hyperboloid, and um, they better be tuned to make sure you get the pitch you want. Okay, But if we just did that, that's not going to just get that screw. Like, sure, it's already going to be redundantly constrained, so by the way, if we go back to the fact chart, what we just did is, is we picked four things from this. So we're actually going to get this freedom space. And you'll notice there is a screw in there. Right there's the screw, and it will get the pitch you want, but there's all these other screws, and there's all these red, red rotation lines. So you're going to get three degrees of freedom, and you're already going to have one redundant degree of freedom if you stop with that. Okay, But, but we're going to keep going. Okay, So now we're going to put it, and, and see you can make this and stick it on the side. Okay, but now we're going we're gonna to do another circular hyperboloid and we're, you know, just for kicks we're going to move it down to show you that they're not all stuck at the same point. We're going to move the point down, the neck of the, you know, the, the disk and, and, and all its circular hyperboloids that share the same neck. You can move that up and down. So we move this one down and we pick a different D2 and theta2 and, and of course they all have to be the same um, so that they all lie on the same circular hyperboloid. Um, but again, we're picking four, um, and again, that's, that's already another redundant constraint, so we've got another redundant constraint. But what, what we do is we, we, we tune D2 tan theta2 to be the same pitch as before. That's what's so critical. You know, this twist can only have one pitch, it's, it's what it is. And so for both circular hyperboloids, you know, P better equal D1 times tangent theta1, and that better equal D2 times tangent theta2. Okay, and as long as you do that, then you should get a screw with the pitch of P. Okay, um, if you combine those, these are the four just with, from that circular hyperbolic, but we're going to combine them with this. So you can see these inner ones are from that other circular hyperbolic we just did, those outer ones are from the first circular hyperbolic we just did. And uh, sure enough, we have a nice symmetric thing. It gets a beautiful uh, screw. And, you know, we made it nice and symmetric. Um, you know, I suppose we could have made it axisymmetric. That probably would have been a much better design. So you pick three from each uh, circular hyperboloid. Uh, but then, you know, things would have been over constrained by one, right? Because you really need five constraints to be exactly constrained, but there's no way to axisymmetrically do it. So the smartest way would be to pick three from one cylindroid that are axisymmetric, three from another cylindroid that are axisymmetric, and then you've got six constraints, one redundant, but it'd still get a nice screw. This we had square, so we picked four from each circular, or circular hyperboloid. And um, as a consequence, uh, we're over constrained uh, right by, by uh, well, there's eight in there, and we really need five, so we're over constrained by three. There's three redundant constraints in here. And one degree of freedom, six minus one is five, but there's eight, so three. Eight minus five is three, okay? But you can see it gets this beautiful thing. And this is just CAD, uninfluenced by anything. It's a beautiful translation, beautiful rotation of the pitch that, that I designed for. OK? So you can see how you can design for screws. OK, so, so with that, 
Um, all right, so let, let's, uh, let's, let's revisit some old examples here that I, I was a little bit deceptive because you weren't prepared to hear the full truth, right? So remember, uh, we, we, for this, we, you know, this, this had these non-orthogonal wires. We drew the blue lines, and then we tried to find all the red lines that intersect all the blue lines, and we did. We found them. We found this one. We found this one. And we said, yeah, they're not stuck on that coordinate system like old engineers do. That, that was the lesson there. But at that time, you probably didn't. And I said, that's it. You know, there's no other degrees of freedom, which is right. There's six minus four. There's two. So there's two independent degrees of freedom. And those are two red rotation lines. And it's like, that's it. But what you probably didn't realize back then is you might have, I'm not sure you made the connection, but you should have said, well, but wait a minute, anytime there's two or more degrees of freedom, there's always infinite permissible motions. There's always infinite permissible motions. So, you know, how could there just be these two? There's, you know, there's either just one, or if there's two, there's infinite, you know, permissible motions. So, um, but, but if you stare at this all day, you'll never find another red line or red hoop or black translation arrow that, that satisfies the, the rule of compromise patterns. But the fact is, First of all, if you found this freedom space in the fact chart, first of all, it's, there's two degrees of freedom, so you look in 2DOF. Let's find it. You can see, aha, this freedom space is the only freedom space that contains the two skew uh, rotation lines. In this case, they happen to be the extreme generators, but they don't have to be, right? Um, but in, in this example, they are. Uh, you know, anytime you have two red lines that are skew 90 degrees, um, it will be this freedom space and they will be, the two extreme generators will be the red ones. Okay, so this is exactly what it is. And, and you can see here, yes, there's no more red lines, but there's an infinite number of screws within a cylindroid. And those all have different pitches. You'll, you'll, you'll also notice later on um, uh, in some of my pictures, I, I will color the greens screws with dark or light greens according to the pitch they are on um, the absolute value of the pitch right um, but it doesn't look like I did that here so so but um, but anyway the, the point is is yes there were only two red lines that satisfied the rule of concrete patterns there was no more but there were infinite permissible motions as there always will be if there's two or more degrees of freedom that result from the linear combination of of two independent things and, and in this case, it's the cylinder with all the screws, okay? So you could imagine if I um, rotate this, you know, some amount and rotate this some amount uh, simultaneously, the same amount, well, then this thing would actually screw about one of these axes um, with the pitch defined there, okay? And if you, if you rotate these different amounts simultaneously, you'll access different screws with different pitches and there'll be coupled rotations with translations, okay? And the other thing to note is, if that's the freedom space, check out the constraint space. We're familiar with this one, except, except we looked at this before with those planes sweeping out those disks on top and bottom um, with the translation screws. Now, because it's blue, we don't care about translation or screws. Um, we just have this guy, and you can see clearly that uh, these wires definitely lie within that constraint space. So you could imagine Here's one of the disks on this plane, and it could just sweep through to get to that one. And same thing here. This could be the axis, and this guy could sweep through. Okay? So you can see that is a clear thing from that constraint space. Okay, so now let's now that you know what screws are, we're, we're prepared to look at a little bit more about cylindroids, okay? And and I, I it's very important. So you know the geometry of cylindroids, and you know there's three freedom spaces that are cylindroids, and you know they're largely populated by screws. Okay, that you know. Okay, but let, let's talk a little bit more about them in the context of these freedom spaces. So, first of all, um, one of the freedom spaces has no red lines in it. It's just all uh, non-zero, non-infinite pitches. Okay, um, some of the things not zero or infinite but real pitches, uh, if you have that, um, that, that's one of the freedom spaces. And the way that will be generated is if the two extreme, or sorry, the two principal pitches, that, that's the ones, that are, yeah, the two principal screw pitches um, are, have the same sign. Now remember, the principal screws, or the principal twists in this cylindroid 
are the ones that are halfway down the length of the cylinder and are 90 degrees, okay? So if those two have values P2 and P1, and they both have the same sign, say they're both positive, so like one and three, then the whole thing will be just green, okay? Or if they're both negative one or negative three, then the whole thing will be green. Now here, here's the way it kind of works. Um, as they ride up to the extreme gender and go back down, they go through all the pitch values in between. So if this was one and this was three pitch value, this would go from one and eventually get to two and then it would get to three as it goes down. And if it went the other way down around the other way, um, it would also go from one to three. Okay? But it, so if they're both negative, then they'll both go from negative one to negative three, if, if that's the negative values, right? So you can see why it would never go through zero, why there would never be a red, okay? But if there is a, a single red one, then it has to be uh, one of the principal generators. So there's, that, that's a really important principle. There's no way to have a cylindroid with a single red rotation in it unless that single red rotation is a principal generator. Okay, so if you ever find a cylindroid with one red one and it's not the principal generator, you've done something wrong, okay? So they're always the principal generator, okay? And then this can be something else. It would be some screw, or, you know, a pitch of positive or negative. It really doesn't matter. And, and then everything would be this. And, and it makes sense because say, say this is zero, obviously it has to be, and say this is negative three or whatever, negative four. Well, it'll go from zero to negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four as it walks both ways till it gets to it, okay? And th that's how the screws will vary along there. And if it's positive, it'll all be positive going. So you can see why it would never get a zero, okay? But if your two principal generators have opposite signs, so one is positive and one is negative, say this is positive one and this is negative three, okay? Then as you march from negative three to positive one, you're obviously gonna go through zero somewhere. Okay, in both directions, going up, down, along this, or down to the other side. Um, so there's always going to be two red ones in that one. Okay, and they'll never be the principal generator. And sometimes, they, depending on what they are, they could be the extreme generator, as I drew in this case, but they often aren't. Ooh. Yeah, they often aren't. So that's important to know. So, so remember, if it's a freedom space filled with this a cylinder with all screws, then the two principal things have the same sign, either positive or negative. If there's one rotation in it, it better be one of the principal generators, and then the other one can be positive or negative, and the rest of it's green. And if it has two red ones in it, they're definitely not going to be the principal generator. They could both be the extreme generator. If one's the extreme generator, the other one will be the extreme generator. Oh, actually, I'm not sure that's entirely true. I'll have to think about that. I think that's true. No, that's true. That's definitely true. Yes, that's, that's definitely true. If, if one of the red ones this extreme generator, the other red, red one will be the extreme generator. Um, and then, uh, but, but they don't have to be. They could, you know, as I, I've, I've drawn here, this one's kind of randomly in the middle here, and this one's randomly in the middle. Doesn't have to be, okay? And here's why. Here, here's like another thing that's key, is that the height of the cylindroid, H, if you put this in a cylinder, the height between the two extreme generators is the difference, the absolute value of the difference between the two principal generators' pitches. So you take the screw, the pitch of those twists, subtract them and take the absolute value, and that's the height. Okay, and, and this is, by the way, this is all proven in, in my master's thesis, a nice uh, tucked away chapter on cylindroids, so you can go through the derivation of this. But, but you can also prove that the uh, principal, um, you can also prove that uh, the extreme generator pitch will equal the average of the two principal generator pitch. Okay? So basically, if you add them and divide by two, that will be the principal or the extreme generator, and both of those have to be the same. Okay? So that, that's, why, that's why I said, you know, if, if one of those extreme generators is zero, then this other extreme generator will definitely have to be zero. So the, the two extreme generators have to be the same pitch, and they are the average of the two principal generators, which do not have to be the same. So these will always be 90 degrees from each other. Those will always be 90 degrees from each other. These will be 45 degrees from each other always, uh, and, 
and but those will be the same pitch and those can be different pitch okay okay all right so that those are some important notes on cylindroids as they pertain to freedom spaces okay so the the next thing to talk about here um, are tricks for linking desired motions to freedom spaces okay so one of the hardest parts of the fact design approach is you know is, is linking from say I give you a bunch of motions I want a flexure system to achieve it's like okay well that's great but which freedom space does that link to because once you have the freedom space you're gold you, you already know the constraint space from the chart and then you can deduce all the sub constraint spaces or you have my master's thesis to look it up for the each constraint space and then you just uh, go through choose your own adventure and you go through all your options and see which one generates the best design um, Okay, but, but it's a real trick linking from what they want to, to the freedom space. And sometimes they may not even give you uh, permissible motions that are independent. You know, th they may give you four. There's like, I want a rotation here, a rotation here, a translation there, a translation there. And maybe two of them are, are dependent. And so it's really only two degrees of freedom. So that really throws you off because then you, you may not know what column to even look in. Just because they gave you four motions that they want doesn't mean they're all independent and lie in the four do of column. So how do you know what column to look in precisely and how do you know what freedom space? Because there's always one best freedom space. No matter what combination of motions they give you that they want, there's always a freedom space that is the best answer by far, that ha contains all the motions they want with as few extra permissible motions as possible. That's always, that's by definition the best freedom space. I'll say that again. The best freedom space contains all the motions they want with as few extra permissible motions as possible. Okay? How do you link to that? Okay? There are, I think we're going to do four methods. I'm going to start from the most arduous to the most efficient and, and from, the, from the worst to the best. Okay? <laughs> but, but the, you know, they're all, the first is foolproof um, in many ways, but it's just going to take a lot of time on an exam. The only time you'd ever do this is if you're forced to on an exam and I'm testing your ability to do it. Um, but I, I do want you to understand the math and how you could do it with math, okay? So, okay, so, so let's, say, let's say they said, I want, so here's your XYZ axis, and say they said, I want you to get a rotation about the X axis, a rotation about the Y axis, and two rotations on the XY plane, um, but they're spread out from the X and Y axis by 30 degrees like this. Okay, now you're probably really smart at this point. You probably know, well, duh, that's a disk. That's, you already know the freedom space because intersecting rotation lines all on the same plane make a disk. And heaven's sakes, it already almost looks like a disk the way, the way they've drawn it. There's so many rotations they asked for. But, and you already know that you're, you're smart enough to know disks only contain two things. And so um, two of these were dependent. They were, they were too dumb to realize that they gave you four motions, but there are only two degrees of freedom there. Okay? But, but say you didn't know that. Say they gave you something much more complicated, something crazy that you, you have no idea how many are independent and how many are dependent, how many degrees of freedom, what freedom space. Well, what you can do is you can mathematically define these twists. We did this in a past example, T1, T2, T3, T4. This was uh, lecture two, right? And, uh, and then what you can do is um, add them together Okay, linearly combine them with different magnitudes and then get the twist freedom space, remember that six by one vector that has all the magnitudes, omega one, omega two, omega three, omega four, and um, decompose it, deconstruct it, and interpret the math to interpret what shape it would be, and voila, you have found the freedom space. But again, it's very arduous, it takes some serious logic and some math skill, and, and it's, it's a little bit painful. Um, uh, and then, and then, by the way, if, if once you find the shape, you could look at what column it's in, and that tells you how many degrees of freedom it is in the fact chart. Or you could put these four in a matrix and do Gaussian elimination. It would tell you two are independent. Again, that would be much more arduous. The much faster way would be, once you know the shape, look in the, t the fact column and see what, what column number it's in. Okay, but that's, that's one... That's one uh, um, Let's see, a recall from lecture five, section time, linear combination of twists. Oh, was that? Oh, okay, so sorry, that was lecture five, not lecture two. <laughs> so, sorry, okay. Uh, bad, bad memory here. 
Okay. Um, okay. So, so um, the second method is to use the rule of comparing patterns. This is slightly less painful because it doesn't involve math, and it's kind of that visual game, um, and uh, and it will work if if you're good at the rule of comparing patterns. But again, it's it's more arduous than using the fact library. So so. Um, Say I gave you these four intersecting things. Here, ones on the x-axis, ones on the y-axis. These are space 30 degrees. You know, so I give you this, but I'm, I'm not smart enough to know it's a disk. Well, what you do is you find all the blue lines intersect all the red lines. And then, I mean, at this point, you could just look at the fact chart and see the constraint space and know what it is. Okay? But if you want to be even more arduous and like pretend you don't even know the fact chart and you're just sticking to method two, you could then... Once you found all the blue lines intersect all these four red lines, you could find all the red lines intersect all the blue lines, and you would find the disk. And that's how you could find the freedom and constraint space. Okay? So I give you the red lines, they give you the red lines, and you use rule of complement patterns, et cetera, um, to go from blue back to red, and now you have the whole thing. Now, this, this method, the last method will work if there are screws involved. This method won't work so great if there are screws, because remember, the rule of comparing patterns only works for uh, rotations and translations. Um, you know, you can only find blue lines that intersect uh, red lines and red hoops, not, not green lines. So th this won't work for screws, but thank heavens, most of the time when people specify motions they want, they don't want crazy combinations of screws. Maybe they just want one screw or a couple screws, but um, uh, it's very rare that someone wants some complex screw. Okay, so th this will work better and faster than the math approach, okay? As you get better at it, okay? All right, so the third and better way is to just, you know, they give you this, you pull out your freedom space, or your freedom chart, or your fact chart, okay? And you look at it, and you say to yourself, here's your reasoning. There, there's two ways you could, you could dial in on where it is on the fact chart. And again, this doesn't use the rule of comfort patterns or any math. You just pull out your fact chart, and here's what you do. So you say, okay, they gave me four motions. Um, I don't know if they're independent, but it sure is not going to be in the 5 do f column because they only gave me four. We're not going to create a fourth, right, or, or a fifth. So we don't need to look in here. If those are all independent, let's pretend we're done. We don't know two of them are dependent. Say we, you know, then, then it might lie in the 4 do f column. Okay, so, so you start in the 4 do f column, and you say to yourself, okay, does, do those four lines lie in this type? It's like, yeah, absolutely. You can see there's a bunch of disks all in here. Okay, do those four lines lie in this? Well, yeah, maybe you can't see it, but if you can zoom in on your fact chart, um, uh, there's, uh, there's this plane here um, you know, that's filled in red, and those four things could be on that plane. And, okay, so it's like, okay, it's in both. And then you can look in here, and it's like, oh, there's a big sphere there and a plane it could be in. So, so you could say it's in that one, it's in that one, and it's in that one. And so here's the rule. If it's ever in more than one, you have the wrong column. Okay? Because, yes, this, this constraint space will achieve the motions you want, but there'll be a lot of extra unwanted permissible motions. There's a ton of extra motions in here that you don't want and, and you don't need to have. Okay? And the way you identify this is if that's in more than one space. Okay? So if you were doing this approach, you, yeah, it's in there, it's in there. Right when you got to this one, you didn't need to check this one because once it's in two, move to the other column. Okay, so you're so like, okay, maybe one is dependent, three are independent. So you go through and say, does it lie in that one? Well, sure it does. There's a disk, we're in those, those are the interlocking red disks, if you don't remember. And so it could lie in one of those disks. Does it lie in here? No. 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 Does it lie in here? Yep, there's a disk. Does line here? Yes, there's a bunch of disks in there. Does line here? No, that's just a box. Does line here? Yes, that's a plane. You can put the disk anywhere in there. Um, so it's like, again, uh, there's multiple things in this column, so you know it's the wrong column. And you didn't need to check all four that I did. Once you got to two, you could have moved over if you, to save yourself time on an exam. Okay? Okay, then you get to the two. So already you know, just by deduction, that this, you know, has, has two DOFs or less, okay? And so then you try and find it here. No, 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 Yep, that's the only one. So because you found uh, a column that has that and it's the only one in that column, that is the correct freedom space. It has all the motions you want because it's inside of it, but it has as few extra motions as, as, as possible. So this is the best one to do. 
and, and, and then you're done, right? 